First Peter chapter one. Over the past several months, I have taught, I don't even know how many topical series uh, aimed at different aspects of our relationship with the Lord, growing in our faith. I felt compelled by the Holy Spirit uh, a month or so ago uh, to, to do an expository series verse by verse through the book. Expository means going verse by verse to uh, just work your way through a particular book. And I felt directed to 1 Peter as I felt the Holy Spirit stirring that. I wasn't quite sure why 1 Peter. If, it was, if I was going to preach one of my favorite books, I would probably preach the book of Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians. I love the practicality of it. I like the spirit of unity in it. I love the fact that it's building the body of Christ. But I felt the Holy Spirit direct me towards 1 Peter. And in the directing towards 1 Peter, I asked the Lord, Lord, why, why do you want to go to 1 Peter? And this is what I felt the Holy Spirit said to me. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, my people are not ready for persecution. So I'm going to start this series with that thought today, that my people are not ready for persecution. I want to say thank God for America. Thank God for the country we live in. There are countries literally around the world that are wanting to be in this nation because it is a great nation. And I think we would all agree that we're seeing some huge pendulum swings in our nation as far as morality and the leadership of government and so forth. And um, the scripture tells us very clearly that God puts kings in places. In other words, who we have for presidents in nations around the world aren't there necessarily because of your vote. They're because God is working an end-time plan in this world that you and I live in. And I believe who we have for presidents in our nation are there because the Lord is trying to work something in us. Amen? Amen? And uh, so, you know, we, we as people can point our fingers at the government. We can say what we want about the government. We can blame leadership of the government. But ultimately, God is in charge. And as soon as we get that reality in perspective, it'll help us with our politics a little better. That God places men there because sometimes he's working things in a nation. And not just in a nation, he'll put a man in a nation to stir something in another nation. And we're beginning to see, we're beginning to hear the rattling of the end times, if you would, that uh, the nations are beginning to be aroused. We hear that the scripture says in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be incredible pestilence and thing. The list goes on of what is going to happen in the last day. And you and I are approaching that quicker than we realize, quicker than we understand. Us as Americans, we love to bury our head in the sand and hope we wake up tomorrow and things are going to get better. I've got good news for you today. The Word of God is alive and active and it's always true. And the Word says that it's not going to get better. In the last days, perilous times will come. This is great news, preacher. I'm so glad I came to church today. I hope by the time you leave today, you are glad you came. Because I'm going to give you some perspective that in the last times, when it seems like all hell is breaking loose, you've got something to hold on to. How many know when you've got something solid to hold on to when things are falling apart, it's a good thing? Amen? Matthew chapter 24, before we get into 1 Peter, let me just read a passage of scripture for you. It speaks of what it will be like in the last days. It says, Christians will be handed over to be persecuted. Christians will be handed over to be persecuted. This is happening right now in the world. There are many of our brothers and sisters, and you and I are in this, this country of, of pseudo-security right now, and uh, we don't see the violence up close in that hand like many of our brothers and sisters are seeing around the world where literally they are being beheaded by the hundreds. 
Husbands are held while their wives are raped and children are killed in front of them. This is, this is the kind of stuff that's going on in our world. And you and I live in this little bubble of so-called security. But I want you to know the bubble's about ready to break. This is what I'm sensing in my spirit, that God's saying the people, the church, had better be ready, had better be prepared. And I'm not talking down to you, I'm talking to us this morning. I'm in this with you. I understand what you understand, I feel what you feel, and I feel unprepared for what's about to come to this world. And so we better look to the Scripture and see what the Scripture says. And it says that Christians will be handed over to be persecuted, put to death, and hated by all nations. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many will turn away from the faith, betray and hate each other, fighting within the body of Christ. The love of many will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. There will be great distress, listen to this, unequaled from the beginning of the world. And if time had not been cut short, no one would survive. Wow. But for the sake of the elect, the days will be shortened. God has a timetable. I'm here to tell you today that I hope you're one of the elect. I hope you're one of those who have given your life to Christ. I hope you're here today and you're born again. I hope that you've surrendered your life to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The only hope we have in this world is that reality, the reality of salvation. The hope of eternal life is in salvation. So I have a sense in my heart that as much as I hate to say this, that persecution may come in our day. You and I may experience persecution of some form. We're seeing early warning signs of it even now. It doesn't take a, a philosopher, it doesn't take a scholar, it doesn't take a genius to look at our culture and understand that Something is different than it was just yesteryear. And it's not just believers that are, are hearing and saying that. It, it, the world is saying things are getting crazy. And so if the unbeliever, the unregenerated heart is seeing the signs of the time and they're saying things are getting crazy, how much more ought the body of Christ be able to discern the day, discern the time, discern the season that we're in? The scripture says that in the last day, they will call evil good. And they will call good evil. The reality is that the Holy Spirit working through the people of God is a restraining force in the world today unseen as it were in our lives but visual through the reaction of the body of Christ on multiple levels and forms and by that I mean if you and I if every Christian in the world was to were, were to not be saved today lawlessness would abound and we would live in a chaotic, reckless society. But because of the grace of Christ resting on the body of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit working through the saints, there is a restraint on the earth today. You and I are in cahoots with the Holy Spirit in restraining lawlessness in the world. Can you say thank God? So it leads us to 1 Peter. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, prepare our hearts.
Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within us. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to discern. Give us a hope to hang on to. You've given us a hope, Lord. I'm asking that you would give us the wisdom to understand that hope. I'm asking that you'd give us the grace to be able to grab a hold of the hope that you've given. It is that hope, the anchor that is steadfast and sure, anchored in the throne of heaven. That will be the thing that sustains us through the days, weeks, months, years ahead. Jesus, you are that hope. And I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us over the next several weeks how to be prepared for the season that we're going into, we pray. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, to set a little context, the book of Peter is written by a fisherman one of the disciples, he's the big mouth of the group, the one who acts first and asks later. Peter, who denied Christ, later receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, stands in front of a large group of people and proclaims unequivocally that Jesus Christ is Lord. Peter now at the setting that we're about to launch into in 1 Peter, he's near the end of his days. Peter's up in years. He has invested most of his life as an apostle to the churches that he's sending this letter to. The beginning of chapter 1 tells us of the regions that he is addressing this letter to. There are five of them that he mentions, and, and it is it, the area that he's addressing is what we would refer to today as the modern day Turkey. The nation of Turkey is the where these letters got sent out to. The people of this region or these regions are there because they're being persecuted for their faith. They were being chased from where they lived. They were losing their homes. They were losing jobs. They were literally losing family members to death. And they're running. They're fleeing for their lives. And it is in this context, it's in this setting that Peter sends these letters to what would be his spiritual children. And he's giving the wisdom of God to them. You have to remember that Peter was a Jew, and Jews didn't talk to Gentiles. It was forbidden in the Jewish culture for a Jew to speak with or associate with Gentiles. But you remember Gen uh, Acts chapter 10, when Peter has a vision on the rooftop, he's Scripture says that he was hungry and he was waiting for dinner to be done and he fell into a trance. Many a man has fallen into a trance waiting for dinner to take place. Hallelujah. But this was a godly trance and Peter in his, in his trance has a, a vision of this sheet being let down. The scripture says it happened three times while he was in the trance. And on the sheet were all kinds of unclean things to a Jewish mind. And the Lord speaks to Peter in his trance. And he says, Peter, eat. And Peter says to the Lord, no, Lord, I, I don't touch or eat the unclean thing. And God, listen, God says to him, don't you call unclean what I've called clean. And the Lord was about ready to turn a dial from the Jewish people now to you and I who are the Gentiles. Can you say amen? 
And Peter began, began as he came down from the trance, the Lord told him that, Peter, there's some men here at the door waiting for you. I want you to go with them. And he comes downstairs and he says, I'm the man you're looking for. And it's Cornelius' friends that were sent. And they go to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius is so excited about this apostle because he was instructed by the Lord to call for the apostle to come. And Cornelius calls all of his family and he fills the house. And they're all waiting and expecting. And Peter begins to preach to the Gentiles. It was the beginning of his Gentile ministry. And this was the first of the children that he would write this letter to that are now scattered abroad because of their faith. I've heard it said if you were arrested today for your faith, is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? And I ask that of us today in this place. If you were arrested today for your faith, is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Is it just a name that you carry or is it a life that you live? Christian is not a title. Christian is a lifestyle. It simply means Christ-like. To live like Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, then the life should be lived like Christ. As Peter's writing this at the shortness of his life, writing to the children of his faith, his call to the church then was to see their trials as a way to increase their faith. I want you to see your trials as a way to increase your faith. Stop. Put the brake on. Put a period. Hold. Pause. Just for a moment. Peter's asking you. He's asking me. Do you see your trials as a testing of your faith? Do you see your trials as a way for your faith to increase? See, when we take tests, we, at the end of the test, it says, Yes, I got the material. Or, I really missed it, I failed. I didn't quite comprehend what I was supposed to comprehend because I, I couldn't do the test. This is not a condemning thing, it's a reality thing. The trials of our faith only give us a mirror to look into and say, yes, I'm doing it. I'm living out the life of Christ or Man, I'm not doing so well. God, would you help me to do better? And Peter, knowing that many of the people he was preaching to had been persecuted themselves, have had lost family members, have lost their jobs, they're driven from their home, they're living on scraps here and there and hoping that they can find somebody in the body of Christ that can show the gift of hospitality to them. And Peter's saying this, I hope that you realize that your trials are just a way to increase your faith. I don't know about you, but if I was one of them, I'd want to slap Peter in the face. <laughs> Who do you think you are? I just lost my home. I just lost my wife. I just saw my little child killed, and you're telling me that I'm supposed to view this as a way to increase my faith? Peter, who do you think you are? But the same call goes out to us as well. Look beyond your current troubles and rest in God's power. I, I, know, I know looking out today, many of your situations and circumstances, I don't know all of them, but I know many of them. 
And I want to say to us today, as the people of God, look beyond your current troubles and learn to rest in God's power. Death holds no sting. Failure holds no victory. Sin has no longer power over you. Oh, but pastor, if you only knew what I did this week. God does. And you know what he's saying? Get back up. You're mine. Do you know who you are today? Get back up, child of God. Man of God, woman of God, it's okay. Death has no power over you. Sin has no power over you. Yeah. If we took a moment and just asked how many, how many have failed lately, there would be hands going up all over this room. <laughs> but thanks be to God who has given us the victory. Failure, we've often been told, is not failure unless you fail to get back up. And I would say that to us today. Failure is not failure. We don't have to be bound by that. And so hope, hope ends up being the cure for us as we struggle through trials. Have you struggled through a trial lately? Can I get a witness of some strugglers on the journey? Is, is that really all there is? It has, has anybody else in the room struggled on the journey lately? It's okay. Look around, fellow strugglers. This place is not my home. I'm only passing through. Can I get an amen this morning? And so Peter gives us three things to hang on to. The first is found in verse 3 and 4, where hope is discovered. Have you discovered hope lately? Have you found the anchor of hope to be true in your life? I have a brother who uh, just went through a a uh, horrific time, a sinful time, where he strayed far and fast from who he is as a man of God. It caused a separation in his marriage. But hope, hope is an anchor that has a very taut line to this planet. And all who can grab a hold of that taut line can find themselves back in the graces of God. It's not that his grace ever left you. It's just that your circumstance, it made it feel that way. But when you grab a hold of that line, that taut line of hope, it has a way of putting things back in perspective. Notice what he says in verses 3 and 4. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about hope. And Paul says, if you're going to hope, you better learn to praise. But don't praise the Red Sox, the White Sox, the Red Skins, or any other skins. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? 
In the middle of your struggle, have you found the cure of praising the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? See, that, 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 that taunt rope that I was talking about, it is anchored there. It is the straight line into the throne room of heaven whereby every saint, when they grab a hold of it, can look into the throne room of God in the midst of the worst of circumstances and say, I praise the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ. I love the two-letter word in the middle of that sentence, my, my Lord And I hope he's your Lord today. According to his great mercy. Aren't you glad for mercy today? Anybody in need of mercy today? Hallelujah. According to his great mercy. You know what I just got a picture of in my AD mind? It was a piece of bread with a big hunk of peanut butter on a knife. Just smearing it on the bread. Jiffy peanut butter, I'm sure. With his great grace. Ha ha. With his great grace and his great mercy. He has given us a new birth. I'm born again. I'm born again. <laughs> I'm born again. By His great mercy. Are you born again today? I'm born into a new birth, into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from the dead, and into, underline the word inheritance. I'm born again, into a living hope, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, into an inheritance. That inheritance is, notice what it says, that inheritance is imperishable, uncorruptible, unfading, kept in heaven for you. What's he saying? The elements of this world cannot taint, destroy, or diminish this inheritance. This body is getting old. The house I live in has had to have some remodeling to it. The windows don't quite move up and down like they used to. The floors squeak a little bit and my carpet needs to be replaced. But this inheritance that I get will never be imperishable. It will never be corrupted and it will never fade. It is held for me in heaven. He's directing us towards hope this morning. Hope discovered. Saints are being persecuted. Saints, I want you to know that are being persecuted, that it's time to praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has given us a new birth. I know it's tough. I know you're going through a struggle. I know life is difficult, but you have a new birth. And because of that new birth, I've given you a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because you know Jesus was resurrected, you can be sure that this hope is yours. And I've given you an inheritance. And this inheritance, inheritance that you have will never fade away. I know you lost a wife. I know you lost a child. I know you lost a husband. I know you lost your home. But this is not the place we're putting our stakes down. There's places beyond this life. I want you to know, Peter's saying, beyond this life, there's an inheritance for you that will never fade. The shine of it will always be there. It is not imperishable. Or it is imperishable, and it is uncorrupted. 
Peter says, this is what we have to look forward to. So he starts the letter with praise. Praise to God. God's the one who is the orchestrator of the plan of salvation for all mankind. The scripture says, for God so loved the world that that God gave his son. And whoever believes on that son, Jesus Christ, not Buddha, Mohammed, or any Confucius or confusion of any kind in the world, there is not many roads to heaven, many paths to heaven, many ways to get to heaven. There is one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. And if you hear anyone telling you that there is another Christ or there is another way or there is another system to get to heaven, by all means tell them that they really don't know what they're talking about because you found the one true way. And his name is Jesus. So he says praise because praise has a way of taking your eyes off the bleak situation that we're going through and putting it on something that's eternal. Praise puts things into perspective. Many times when I have people come to my office and they're counseling, I'm counseling with them and there's a spirit of discouragement or uh, depression on them, I, I ask this question. I said, when's the last time you just turned on Christian music and just praised God for a while? This is what I get almost without, without question. Pastor, it's been a long time since I've done that. I'm too depressed to do that. I'm too discouraged to do that. And this is my words of encouragement. I want you to go home. When the kids are out of the house, the husband's gone, turn on a Christian radio station. When a song comes on, you know, let it rip. Let it rip. Let the vocal cords, I don't care if you sing in tune or not, and neither does God. He wants some praise to come from your heart. Praise is like a carburetor cleaner. It cleans the, the carburation of your soul that's all mucked up from the world and discouragement and despair and failure and fear. Praise has a way of breaking through all of that. But persecution has a way of taking things out of perspective. Suffering is real. And suffering, have you ever noticed, many of us in this room have gone through periods of suffering, an illness, a loss, loss of a job, loss of a family, loved one, whatever the case. They're, they're, they're seasonal. They're, they're, they, they, go through, they go through times. There's some of you who are chronically sick, so it's like a lifetime of sickness for you. And you're, you're saying to yourself, you're saying to me, this is not a short thing. I feel like I've been going through this for a long time. And if we're not careful, fear, fear can overwhelm us. Fear can rob us. It can rob us of joy. It can rob us of hope. And it has, has not been given us by God. The scripture says in Timothy that he's not given us a spirit of fear. But what has he given us? He's given us a spirit of power. Come on. And, and a sound mind. That sound mind means a disciplined mind, a well-disciplined mind. A disciplined mind is a mind that can discern what the situation is, why it may be happening, but in spite of it, there is something beyond the situation. There's something beyond the circumstance. This is what Peter is trying to get their attention on. So when, when it comes to this spirit of fear, we need to recognize where that spirit's coming from. Address that immediately. Fear cripples. The longer you allow that spirit to hang around you, the longer it will cripple you. The more devastating the crippling will be. You literally are listening to the voice of Satan. Fear has no place in the kingdom of God. 
the absence of fear is what able, enables Christians to be placed on a stack of wood covered in oil, roped to a stake, and while the flames start burning, they begin to sing praise to God. Wow. Does that not seem crazy to you? I want to say that that is unnatural. But it's very spiritual. Many of the martyrs have gone through that. In fact, Matthew chapter 10 tells this to us. He says, don't be afraid of the one who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Don't be afraid of the one that can kill the body. Any, any man on this planet, any force, any government, all they can do is destroy this body. This body is not who I am. This body is only the tent that I live in. I kind of like it but I don't like it nearly as much as the new one I'm getting. So, so this, this body is just something we live in, and, and if we're not careful, our perspective can get off of eternity and get so much onto who this thing is that we fear that they can kill this body. When in reality, if you kill this body, you haven't killed me. I simply get graduation to another, to my real home, my real place of eternity, my real living, where I'm going to live for eternity. This life is just a short time. So you're 90. So you're 110. Who cares? In light of eternity, it's a drop in the bucket. And this life has nothing compared to what we will have in the latter. Eternity's hope takes the sting out of present suffering. Wilfred, I remember our time in Haiti. What a glorious time. I'm, I'm there in this hot room Filled, packed with Haitian believers, young and old. I'm from America. I'm blessed. I have a beautiful home. I have a beautiful wife. I have three beautiful children. I, I, I have a job. I, have fun. I, don't, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat this afternoon. But I'm there in Haiti and I'm surrounded by people and many of them didn't have all of those material blessings that I had. But what I found was this. <laughs> a room filled with people who knew how to praise God in the midst of difficult circumstances. Listen, I've got a bed with some memory foam on the top. We went down and watched the kids in the orphanage, and they had uh, literally a thatched mat on the floor, a large thatched mat that had been on there so long that the dirt had started working its way up. And we asked, well, what is this room for? And they said, this is where the orphans sleep. And I thought, oh, God. The same orphans that I just saw upstairs dancing around and praising and worship sleep on that. You see, because they understood that it wasn't the present circumstances that define who we are. It's our Lord and Savior who has been died, death in the grave, but he rose again and he ascended to the Father. And there he's put a place of an inheritance for you and for me. And there, the Haitians, oh my, I wish, I, I wanted to tell them to stop. They would repeat a song over and over again. And I thought, these people love God. They worshipped and they worshipped and they worshipped. They wearied me. They literally made me tired. They worshipped so much. I thought, God, I don't have anything compared to these people. I don't have anything compared to these people. I wish we could just get an ounce of Haitian worship in this room on Sunday morning. 
I promise you it would change the culture of how we worship in this house. It's people who understand this is not my home. Secondly, hope is assured. Verse 5. He says, you, persecuted saints. Hey, 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 you, persecuted saints. You're being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You can hear the natural man saying, protected, Peter? You call the death of my wife protected? You call the death of my child protected? You call the loss of my home protected? Peter's saying, yes, I do. Your wife, right now, she's so protected. She is in a blissful place. Paul said it this way, to be absent from this body, this old tent, is to be present with the Lord. Your child that you lost, they're in a much better place. No longer do they have to be concerned about the sword. They just enjoy the Savior. He says you're being protected by God's power. That word protected means to, to have a garrison. If you can picture literally having a, a swarm of soldiers, a garrison of soldiers around this salvation. What's he saying? That your body may die, but this salvation of yours, nothing's going to harm that. Man cannot take that. Man cannot remove that. Man cannot diminish that. Your salvation is steadfast and it is sure. Not only are you being protected by God's power, you're being protected by God's power through your faith. And he's saying, in the midst of difficulty, don't let your faith waver. Listen, many of you in this room on your journey you have fallen. I, the chief among you. It's not how many times you fall. It's in your failure, where is your faith rest? Does it rest in your ability to walk in perfection? Or does it rest in his power and his grace to enable you to walk circumspectly as he would have you to? And it's there. That's the faith. Plug that into your radio and play the life out of that faith. Because it's that faith that will hold you. God, I failed. God, I failed. God, I failed. And Jesus says, I haven't. I'm still here. I'm still holding on. I still believe in you. My blood still cleanses you. <laughs> ha my blood still cleanses you your salvation is so so secure your salvation I've got listen nothing's going to steal this relationship between you and I have you ever noticed that when we fail we spend way too much time looking at the failure We spend way too much time moaning about the failure. We spend way too much time telling everybody how bad we were, how we did. Listen, 
There have been seasons in my life where, where I have failed in my walk with the Lord, where I looked anything but Christ-like. And I literally felt for months like I walked around. You ever see those back in the day when they would have those boards that people would wear over their shoulders, straps on their shoulders, a great big board, usually a, an advertisement for a restaurant or something. They would walk up and down the street advertising something. I felt like that person with a great big sin mark on the front. Look at me. I'm a sinner. Look at me. I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I, I felt like that person. And one day, God... God, I was, in a, I was in a coffee shop one morning, and God said, would you stop? That's not how I see you. This faith thing is real. Would you grab back a hold of your faith and let go of your failure? And from that day on, from that day on, I took the sign off. And I began to walk in who God saw me to be. And what I noticed was over the years, the, the, the enemy of our soul loves to bring that failure back up. He loves to remind you. And if you're not walking in faith, that reminder can be detrimental to you. But if you walk in faith, faith reminds the enemy of who you are in Christ. Amen? The last thing is hope is celebrated. He says in verses 6 through 9, notice what he says. You, persecuted ones, rejoice in this. Though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials. Peter's, Peter's not sweeping the trials under the rug. He's saying, I get it. I understand. Many of you have walked in various trials. So that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes, though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Faith. Rejoice in it. Celebrate in it. You love him, though you have not seen him. And though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. Notice the word at the end there, receiving. Not received, receiving. In other words, this salvation of our soul is a process. It is, it is a future finished work with present tense covering. In other words, when God looks at your salvation, he sees eternity. He sees you there. He sees the finished work of your salvation into this, this in, imperishable hope that we have. He, he sees us there, but he realizes that in the present, there is some provisionary power that attest, attends us in the journey that enables us on a day-to-day -day basis to overcome the things of the flesh. Can you say amen? And so the tone of Peter's writing changes from discovering to understanding and then into celebrating. My question for us this morning We live in a media-filled world, bombarded with images, bombarded with thoughts and desires every day long, all day long. In the midst of that, have you lost sight of hope? In the midst of life's difficulties and failures, have, have you taken your eyes off Jesus, 
you're taking your eyes off the inheritance, if you're taking your eyes off the things that he's put in place for us in the future, but he's given us that hope right now. I pray that you and I don't have to experience the kind of persecution the hearers, receivers of this letter have gone through and in time past this letter would have gone through. But should it happen, my prayer for you and for me is God, would you help us to hang on to hope. Help us to hang on to hope. Celebrating this hope is possible because of three defining truths. Verse 6, trials are just a short time. Can you say thank God? Listen, e even if your trial lasted your whole life, Say, oh, preacher, you don't understand. I've been this way my whole life. Hold on. Your whole life is really, whether we understand it or not, is just a short time. The scripture says, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like a day. What's he saying? He's just simply saying, your time frame, your time schedule is not even on the radar for him. His timetable is way beyond that. Eternity is way beyond the, the confines of this life. The here, the now, your birth, your death. Eternity is way outside of that. And then secondly, he says, the defining truth is, though we have not seen Jesus, he will soon be revealed face to face. You and I, We'll get to see the one we've put our hope and our faith and our trust in all of these life. You and I will get to see Jesus. When I preach like this, the old song comes up in my spirit. I've sang it I don't know how many times from this poem, but it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face. All, all trials will erase. So saints bravely run the race till we see Christ. What a great truth. And lastly, the defining truth is there is a present and a future receiving of our salvation. A present and a future receiving of our salvation. How many have experienced salvation this side of heaven? Go ahead, if you receive salvation this side of heaven, raise your hand. Pastor, I've received salvation this side of heaven. But that isn't all there is to it. It's wonderful as salvation. I remember the day I got saved. I remember my whole spirit man changed that day. This preacher's kid became born again at age 12. I remember not only was my spirit man changed, I physically felt lighter. I've told you the testimony. I remember going to the old prayer chapel. There was a stage like this, and behind that wall, there was a prayer room back there with just wooden benches, and you would pray, leaning, kneeling at these benches. The room was filled with people praying and crying out to God, and I was a 12-year-old back there praying that God would save me, and I got saved. I was in that back corner of that room. And on that side, there was, a, there was a, a screen door. And I remember after spending much time there on the, that hard bench and that hard wooden floor, I got up and I felt so different that when I went out the screen door into my A-frame cabin, I literally felt like I was walking lighter. And I remember laying in my bed on the top bunk and just feeling like, oh God, this is incredible. Salvation is wonderful. But compared to what I'm going to get, it's just a glimpse. Just a glimpse. Many of you have had similar salvation experiences, and we all can say thank God for them. But listen, there's so much more that he has for you and I. As I close this morning, I wonder, 
How many here, as I was preaching today, you might have said, Pastor, I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about, salvation. I mean, I've heard the word maybe before, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever experienced that. I'm not sure I really know what salvation is, and I'd like to know, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to be saved today. Would everyone just stand with me this morning? Jane, if I could have you and the musicians come back. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor, I, I, I'm not sure I can honestly say I'm saved today. I don't know what salvation really is. And you'd like to give your heart to Jesus Christ today. You'd like to be saved right now. You'd like to have that hope that I'm talking about today. That should this life end for you, you know that on the other side, there is a great hope for you, a great inheritance for you that will never fade away. Are you here this morning and you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. I'd like to be saved today. I'd like to know Jesus Christ as a Savior. Is there anyone in the house? Maybe there's several of you here today. You just raise your hand and say, I need to, I need to be saved today. Is there anyone like that? Any hands in the house? I can only assume then that everyone in the sound of my voice has already asked Christ to come into their life and forgive them of their sin. And you believe that Jesus Christ came and he died for you, but he didn't stay in the grave three days later like he said he would. He rose from the grave and many days later ascended to the Father why did he do that? Why did, he, why did God come in the form of a child and live this life, die on the cross, go into a grave, and ascend to the Father? It's because Jesus loved you so much. He came and he gave his life for you. The only ransom for lost humanity was the sacrifice of blood. And Jesus came as a sinless man. I couldn't die for you. Another man or woman couldn't die for you because all of us are born into sin. But Jesus was holy. He was sinless. He was righteous in every way. And he died for you. And salvation happens simply by you saying, Jesus, I recognize who you are. I understand you came and you died for me and you shed your blood for me and you resurrected so that I could have a hope in you. When you understand that, when you believe that, the scripture says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never done that, and you're here today, you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. I'd like to make sure I do that today. So that when this life is over, I know exactly where I'm going, what's gonna happen with me. Is there anyone like that here today? Father, we thank you for hope today. As we go into the season that's ahead of us as Americans, we confess to you that we're way too soft. We confess to you, Lord God, that we're way too comfortable. Our faith hasn't been challenged like our brothers and sisters around the world. But God, we're asking you to prepare our hearts. We're asking you to increase our faith. We're asking you to increase our praise. We're asking you, God, to help us in the midst of life's trials and struggles, to be able to put our life in perspective as we praise the King, we praise our Lord, we praise our Savior, and you begin to cause the things of this world to dissipate. And we're reminded once again of this inheritance we have in Christ Jesus. Help us today, we pray. We ask this in your powerful name. And everyone said, amen. Jane, would you lead us in the chorus?